All right, um, my talk today is about uh, environments as cattle. So the idea about, uh, or the analogy of pets versus cattle for servers, you know, no, not naming them or caring what they're named at least and treating them more like cattle. Um, we've taken that idea and we've, you know, taken it from just servers all the way to environments. It sounds like a lot of people are doing this. Um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Derek DeYoungi. Um, I'm out of Ann, Ar Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, not a football fan, so don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> my employer is Right Brain Networks. We're a uh, consulting shop that focuses on cloud uh, software development and CI/CD things like that. Um, we also do uh, a lot. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So um, there, I've been there for about six years. Um, you know, I'm worked worked my way up from. Uh, support to more of a director uh, director level so I run the uh, pretty much both teams at this point um, uh, so we migrate a lot of cloud uh, a lot of applications to the cloud um, through uh, we take a lot of people through what we call the cloud development life cycle we first take a look at um, you know what uh, what needs to be done, kind of like a sprint zero, and then we go through you know, building it out, and then we can also manage it as well. Um, I've written three books, uh, the Nginx cookbook from O'Reilly, uh, load balancing in the cloud with O'Reilly, and then Nginx unit <coughs> cookbook as well. Uh, I don't use Twitter, so I put my GitHub up there, which it actually does get used, so um, there's some, there's a couple things on there, I think it's called, um, Batch, batch POC or something like that. It does follow this kind of methodology of, you know, being able to set up an environment. So there's a walkthrough and kind of like, um, it's kind of like a demo. Um, you guys can deploy yourself and see how this, this stuff kind of works. So um, the last speaker talked about having lots of different environments and things like that. Uh, we've also heard other things about, um, you know, the, uh, getting or being able to invest time in automation. So this, this should be able to provide you with some ways to get started talking to management about investing in, op, um, in your, your automation to be able to you know, um, you know, kind of sell upwards, right? So uh, what we'll be talking about is the cost of down, uh, non-prod downtime and the, the value of completely automated environments. So this is kind of for QA, um, but our stakeholders here are operations and the owners as well, um, because we're going to be talking a lot about uh, what it costs from a uh, organization to uh, be able to, uh, well, to have downtime in your non-prod. Because, <coughs> yep. So um, because the, uh, how do I say, um, the not only production is, production downtime is not the only thing that actually costs you, um, you know, time, money, and customers, uh, because we have lots of things. So non-prod downtime, right? Like this is your test, your QA, your dev environments. Uh, causes of the downtime would be untested deployments, manual processes, failed version contracts. So that's like, you know, um, this service is supposed to be contracted, or there's an API contract between two services, and when there are, um, you know, a, a large change goes into one, and the other is not actually following that version contract, uh, you can have issues. <clears throat> Insufficient test coverage is uh, definitely a large, large uh, cause of down to, er, uh, issues, and then. Um, I, I see a lot of issues with testing infrastructure changes, right? So from, coming from an operations, um, more of an operations role, um, I get this question a lot, right? How do I test my infrastructure changes on an environment that doesn't affect the devs? Well, you gotta be able to build your own environment. Building your own environment is, you know, investing that time in the, uh, the infrastructure automation to be able to build them and treat them as cattle. So <clears throat> the effect that downtime in a non-prod environment has is there's a lot of unplanned work, right? Um, you sometimes need a developer's attention, 
you need operations attention, and then you've got idle and blocked QA uh, developers. That means less time working on those new features, right? And more time uh, just fixing stuff. So that also puts delays on sprints and the roadmap, um, which causes upper management and your product managers um, some issue. I've had a client tell me that they have had eight hours of downtime in their non-prod environments a week, and it's been a huge issue for them. Um, so basically, uh, their numbers were something around, or rather the, the uh, loss of productivity is like how many devs, how many ops, and how many QA members are you know, not doing, not working towards their sprint um, for forever how much time. So in that, that environment, there's usually um, one dev, at least, that gets involved, uh, one to two operations folk that would be called in to take a look at the, the issue. And then we've got three to 10 QA members that are blocked um, and not able to uh, fulfill their sprint needs. So if you times that by the amount of hours that they said they're, they're, they usually have downtime in non-prod, that's, that's a lot of time. 40 hours to 104 hours, that's significant. You could actually hire a full-time or two full-time employees for, for that much. So what's the cost of lost productivity, right? <laughs> You've got the obvious engineer pay. The sprint and roadmap delays, um, those actually come with some hidden, hidden costs, right? Um, you, with those delays, you have delayed feature release, releases. And then you have uh, missed sales promises, which actually damages the brand and causes issues for your, your sales team. So how can this be prevented? Well, we can automate rollbacks, which tends to be a little bit harder than most people think, um, you know, especially with DML changes uh, specifically. We could shift further left or, uh, and treat our non-prod environments as cattle. So we'll be talking about um, you know, shifting left and treating our environments as cattle. So where are we going to start? <clears throat> well, we need to start first by versioning, right? Everybody has to version. We'll then look at infrastructure management, configuration management, and database management and how those things can help get us to uh, being able to produce environments uh, at will. So first, versioning. Uh, versioning everything is very important. That includes operations, right? So your infrastructure code, your, um, your configuration management code, uh, CICD pipelines, Jenkins, so on and so forth. I recommend semantic versioning to most of my clients. Um, it works. It's pretty much standard at this point. There are some cases where people decided to version differently, but that's okay. And then establish API contracts with semantic versioning. Uh, we will know exactly what's changing. Uh, for instance, the uh, last number there, uh, the 12, is a, a bug or a patch. The second ver number there is a new feature. And the, last, or the first, ver uh, first number there, the single one, is the uh, major. So that actually provides us uh, with an understanding of what, um, what's being changed when a version upgrade happens. So if you're establishing a contract, usually the only number that you care about is that first one because it's a breaking change. That's what majors usually tend to be. Um, so you'll, you'll see that, um, uh, you'll see organizations say, or the contracts between two, two services say, uh, if you do make a major change, a breaking change, then we need reverse compatibility for, uh, we need to be able to use that old API for this long, or we need to know this far ahead of time what that API is going to look like. Typically, we don't see many major version changes, at least not often. And then lastly, never rebuild a version. That is kind of interesting. I see sometimes people building off of things like, um, stage branch or building master or something like that. We typically don't do that. We build uh, as soon as we merge our code into the main line, which is a develop branch. We version it there, and then we never build it again. Yeah. 
An environment is usually built uh, or made up of a few different uh, packages, right? So we've got our infrastructure ver uh, package, our configuration version, and then our application version as well. So all of these together uh, make up what I call the release, right? So if I'm, if I'm able to take the, the infrastructure, the configuration, and the application, put, put all those together, I can reliably rebuild the same uh, environment from the ground up. Some of the, sometimes you'll see all this stuff in the same repo. Um, configuration might be like a Docker file or something like that. Um, and then infrastructure, we'll get to that in a moment. So infrastructure management, we've got a few technologies that we typically look at, right? Um, Terraform. I do like Terraform, um, although uh, it has its things. <laughs> Um, the great thing about Terraform is that it can be used across different, um, uh, different cloud providers and uh, most notably VMware, right? Um, that's one thing about that and it's a, usually a misconception is that you do actually have to rewrite your infrastructure code for the different cloud providers. Um, so it's not like saying, oh well if I I can be cloud agnostic, if I write it with Terraform, I'll just be able to hop over here. Not actually true, you have to rewrite everything. CloudFormation is AWS's standard. Um, ARM templates are Azure. Uh, I typically go for Terraform over ARM for Azure, but CloudFormation is my go-to in Am uh, Amazon um, for lots of reasons, that being that it can be called back to, and you can use waiters and things like that. And then there's Helm for Kubernetes. Um, so all of, these, all of these three things, it doesn't matter what you're using, as long as you're using something to model your infrastructure, um, because it, it needs to be completely modeled, and that's for application servers or your containers, uh, your data stores, your proxies, things like that. And then lastly, DNS. DNS is really important to have modeled in, in some sort of infrastructure management. Um, and we typically, I heard somebody else mention it prior, um, have sort of a standard there, right? So, I like to utilize DNS as kind of a, um, uh, <clears throat> service discovery in a way that you say, all right, here's our domain, it might be an internal or whatever, you guys would be this way, um, and then we go to, you know, we typically go with region, which is our data center or something like that, and then the environment, and then the service. This way, if I know these environment variables, I'll be able to hit any service I need to with just saying, okay, I know the name of the service, everything else that is in that domain name, I know because I'm in that environment. So we can automatically guess exactly where a domain, uh, something is by doing that. Um, but with these templates, uh, we should, because everything is self-contained inside this, uh, this infrastructure management template, we should be able to actually build that domain name and then pass it into our configuration for the other service or proxy or whatever needs to know where that, that endpoint is. Configuration management. <clears throat> so this is stuff like Ansible, Chef, SaltStack, Puppet, Docker. Docker's an interesting one. Um, the reason that we're, we're looking at these is because being a, um, specifically not just the use of it, but the use of it in the right way, right? Being able to take these environment variables from the infrastructure level and then passing them into configuration enables us to treat our, uh, to build environments that know, know exactly how to reach out and touch, uh, touch everything it needs to without actually having to uh, go in there and set, you know, this is your environment. Configuration management is used to install and configure and template out your dependencies, your applications, uh, connection strings, and configuration files. So the big one there, like I mentioned before, it's the, uh, the connection strings or your endpoints to other applications that you need to uh, depend on. Being able to template that out is super important. So um, we, we typically lean towards you know, Docker for a lot of this stuff. Um, and Docker is kind of pushing the, uh, you, you have to use environment variables. If you rebuild your Docker file, or your Docker image for a different environment, you're not doing it right. 
So using the environment variables is, you know, kind of the gold standard. Um, if you use, if you're not quite to Docker yet, that's okay. You know, we've got all these different technologies that can build servers from the ground up without, you know, and it all goes through source control so that you're able to install your dependencies, pull down the version of the application that you're, you need, and then uh, configure your, your configuration files or your connection strings to your other applications and data stores. So database management. You guys just learned a lot about this. It's pretty much I can skip this slide, I believe. Um, but there are other tools. Uh, Liquidbase, Flyway. Um, Liquidbase is... It's XML. You, you put things in XML, and I think you can call raw SQL files. Um, Flyway, it's the go-to for the Java world, so a lot of people are using that. And then Alembic is kind of the go-to for the, uh, the Python world. There's so many of these out there. Uh, I think there's something called like Redgate or something like that that you can spend a lot of money on if you're in the Windows world. Um, but all of these will work as well. So you can automate your default data load. Uh, so when you're building up an environment, you know, like, like mentioned prior, the, uh, you can load in some data and say, okay, this is what you get for QA or test or whatever, um, or you can also snapshot. So in AWS, uh, our CloudFormation actually will uh, snapshot our databases, our RDS databases, when uh, we destroy a, <coughs> destroy a database or pull down, uh, remove a stack. And then we, um, we can use those, those same snapshots to restore when we're building something up. So uh, we've actually done some automation with Lambda that uh, after a, a database has been decommissioned and the QA or developer that is building the environment, um, they can actually go, and, or it would automatically go and find the last snapshot that they personally were using for that environment and then fetch that and use that to build up so they don't lose their QA data. Because QA and dev data is actually important, right? A lot of tests won't run if you don't have the right data there. Or a lot of tests will fail, rather. So this is kind of the, uh, the flow here, right? So things start from your infrastructure, templating. You want to pass through your configuration version, right? So that might be a package of a chef package or something like that, and give that your application version, and then also your connection strings. So your configuration is going to run. That's going to template out the things that are installed, right? So um, <clears throat> install certain packages, uh, pull down the correct version of code from your, your code repository, um, and then set up all the configuration files or connection strings, the environment variables that are needed uh, to be able to pass to the, the application. So what's this look like? Uh, basically, there is a little bit of dependency there. So let's say we build our, we set up our infrastructure, and these things are going to be built first, the things that are not, uh, don't have any dependencies. Um, our queues, our caches, our databases, the proxy. The proxy is an interesting one, because usually you've got uh, nodes that will register to it, so all of the endpoints for all of these things actually get pushed into the configuration of the, uh, you know, your, your synchronous and your asynchronous workers or uh, applications. So let's see, yep. When building that out, um, it's, it's super important to be able to pass this infrastructure level information about our environment down into the the uh, the app or the the build or configuration of these servers. Um, you don't want to depend on an environment name, right? If you're depending upon an environment name, you have to you you assume that these things are pre-made and pre-configured for you, and that's not what you're not able to do that if you're actually doing cattle or if you're treating them as cattle. So with that, we enable a bunch of opportunities, right? Um, we're able to build up envi uh, developer environments. We're able to uh, build feature branch environments. So based off of a feature branch for anything, right, uh, for testing infrastructure, we'd be able to uh, use that version of the infrastructure code before merging, test it out, build up an environment, make sure things are still working. 
Uh, same with your configuration code, your Ansible, your, your chef. You can build up an entire environment and test with that version of the, um, the configuration. And then you can also do it with, um, with the application as well. Another big, uh, big benefit here is being able to shut down non-prod environments during off hours, right? So people leave, everybody leaves at six, you've got a cloud environment, you're spending money from six to eight in the morning, or six in the afternoon to eight in the after morning, shut it off. You don't have to pay for that. If, if you've got things completely automated, you can boot that thing up in a moment's notice before people get into work, you can put it on a schedule, and then everything's ready to rock and roll. If a de developer's staying late, they have the ability to build their own environment and use that. Um, weekends, if nobody's actually working on the weekends, then non-prod environments can go away. You don't have to pay for those. One of the most imp important things that I think about uh, in this is, is the ability to test your deployments, right? Um, you can validate your schema migrations, and you can validate your, uh, your uptime. When I mean up, what I say when I mean uptime is saying that like you have no, everybody's moving towards no downtime deployments, right? But actually validating that and knowing that when I deploy this code to, or deploy this release to this, uh, this environment, being able to validate that this deployment has zero downtime every time is very important. And it provides a lot of value. And then we can reprovision broken environments. We don't have to spend time fixing them, right? We just cattle prod it and move on, get a new one. So we did this for a customer. They told me that it would take eight weeks of two FTEs to build an environment. We got it down to 30 minutes in a Jenkins job. The reason it takes so long for them is because they're running Windows. It just takes a while to boot. But other than that, you know, we can, get, we can typically do this pretty quickly. Uh, in the Kubernetes world, it's instantaneous. If you're running Linux servers, it's you know, somewhere in the 10 minute. It depends on what you're, you're actually utilizing. Um, some databases take a while to build, and then you've got that dependency tree, right? All right. So tips on making this easier. Um, fetch your configs from the environment. So devs, if you're, if you're Building a new configuration or need a new variable uh, in, your, in your code, try and, try and start moving to fetching that from an environment variable before uh, checking a config file, and then fail back to the config file, and that'll give the, uh, uh, make the process a little bit easier as you transition. Never depend on environment names. It's super important. It's kind of an obvious one. And then decouple what you can, right? So you've got a lot of people moving to uh, microservices, right? Um, they cannot be using the same database. If you're using, if you're trying to go to microservices and you've got two services touching the same database, you're not doing microservices. You're doing a distributed mon monolith. You have to decouple to make this uh, to get things going in the right direction. One thing that uh, I found is actually really nice about this is there, or the decoupling is that. You can use common infrastructure, right? So we will layer a network and then like logging and then um, you know, whatever next, whatever you need next and then, or something like um, a cluster. And then we'll be able to put the individual stacks on top of it. Um, so, that, uh, so that you've got multiple portions of this infrastructure code that are actually being built up to uh, come together for one application. Shifting further left, okay. So now that we've got uh, environments that we can build at will, we can shift our integration testing uh, before merge. And this is actually super important because, you know, like I said, we've had downtime just costing companies ridiculous amounts of time, money, and effort. So pull request gets created, you can run your unit tests, and then we would like to set up an environment that is based on the environment that we're looking to merge into, and then deploy to that. So that we're actually testing the deployment of the code, not just that the code's working. Run our integration tests. Integration testing for an environment that's pre-merge 
It needs to be pointed at something that's post-merge. So all the other um, all the other services that your your specific service depends on that isn't in your repository needs to be point those those endpoints need to point at something that's already built and already been tested. So we'll be pointing at something like you know the dev environment or the test environment. We'll report statuses. And that is when people should start reviewing the code. They should have confidence that this code can be deployed, integrates well, and passes its unit tests before they even review it. And that way, you'll end up saving a lot of time and money. All right, I believe that's all I've got. I got time for questions. Do we have any questions? I don't know how it works. <laughs> mm-hmm. The developer. Oh, yeah, before it's merged. Yeah, the merge is at the end. So the question is the code review is at the end of the process. I'm, I'm conf yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea is to shift all that you can before the developer actually looks at the code. Right. Yep, and after the merge, I mean, this pipeline continues and it goes further, right? Basically goes through the same steps, but to known environments telling, you know, and then QA is able to look at it, whatever needs to happen. I've seen a lot of cloud environments and they all differ slightly, but most of them can follow these models, so. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Yes, you can have sacred environments, right? Like, and that, that sort of thing can happen after that merge. So after this merge, we might say go to dev, um, and then from there it goes to test, uh, UAT. Um, somewhere in there I've, I skipped over um, the ability to have like UAT, customer environments. Um, but I, I don't, don't really advocate for trunk based very often, to be honest with you, um, because this works really well with um, more of a uh, what is it Git flow type model, right? Um, not, not we modify our Git flow a little bit. Um, so basically, after it's merged into Dev, um, we and everything passes. Uh, we're we're tagging with a semantic version, and then calling that. We, we merge up through different um, known branches if, if necessary, but the only th really those are just pointers to a, a particular version. That's fine, I get it. <laughs> Uh, I like semantic versioning. It does, like it. Honestly, it doesn't matter as long as you have a version, right? It, it could be the Git hash for for all intents and purposes. Like it doesn't really matter. But I do like um, because we are working 
between teams. Like our infrastructure code can be used by, for self-service by other teams, right? Um, being able to say, hey, this is what this version is and what it means uh, provides kind of um, that, that visibility into what's actually going on, what's being changed. Any other questions? Yeah, it's after the merge. Yep. So basically, we would go through this after the merge um, and do the build, uh, do the version, push the version, tag back to Git or whatever it may be. Um, and then that is what would be put into like S3 or um, what are the other uh, Nexus, you know, n name a uh, um, artifact repository, artifactory, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. This is, this is just pre-merge. This is what I'm trying to say is this is, um, we will go through more testing. It will go through the typical pipeline, but the ability to build uh, environments at will as cattle, we're able to shift a lot of this information, uh, a lot of this testing prior to people actually reviewing the code. And that's, that's really beneficial, I think. Right, so that test deployment portion, that is building up an environment, uh, say, is building up an environment that is at the same level as your dev environment or something like that, and then running your deployment to it, right? So you're also testing your, your CI system, or, or rather, or excuse me, your, your actual deployment. We do a lot of our deployments through CloudFormation, right? So from the top down. So we'll have an environment stood up, and then we'll apply an update to it, and then see what happens. The, the question is, is there stuff happening after this merge? And the, the, absolutely, this is just before, this is just to show that we've taken all, a lot of this testing and put it before the code review. So there is a pipeline after this, right? So after the merge, you're going to run through this again, you're gonna do your testing, you're gonna do your build, you're gonna package, you're gonna version, you're gonna deploy that version to a dev environment or your sacred environments is what I call them. And then if people want, they can take kind of the, the release or the manifest of the infrastructure, the configuration, and the application code and build up an environment at will. Does that make sense? So yeah, it would go through what we call like sacred environments, your known environments, um, but it does like, and that whole process is the same, but we're trying to test our deployment and test, um, do more testing so that we don't disturb QA with a down and down downtime or uh, anything like that to their, what they consider their sacred environments. Any other questions? Cool. All right, thank you guys.